I'd like to open the uh, December 18th planning board meeting and I would like to hold off the beginning for a couple minutes for some of the members to get caught up on the correspondence that appeared on our desk this evening. So we'll take a three or four minute break here while we finish reading the correspondence. Motion to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. Any comments? Hearing none, uh, I'll put it to vote. All those in favor of approval of the minutes of the November 20th meeting, please show by raising your right hand. Minutes are approved. Carried. We have uh, some correspondence in front of us, some that we received earlier. We have a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Erbil regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a letter from T. Peterson regarding Blueberry Ridge. We have a letter from Mr. and Mrs. Sawyer regarding Blueberry Ridge. A letter from L. Bumstead regarding Blueberry Ridge. A letter from L. Flacolt of Toulouse, Blueberry Ridge. A letter from town manager regarding the Blueberry Ridge. We have a copy of the zoning board minutes of 10 one we have a letter from Mr. McDougal regarding the Haskell Private Access Way. Uh, also in front of us this evening, we have correspondence. We received a memorandum. Uh, we received a letter from Mr. Samorian regarding Blueberry Ridge. Uh, we received a letter uh, from Jan Ames community forest specialist regarding Blueberry Ridge. And we have a memo in front of us from the planning office to the South Portland planning office. The first item on our agenda this evening is Joseph Prestacci is requesting a major subdivision review and resource protection permit for the 19 lot Blueberry Ridge subdivision located off Mitchell Road. The application was deemed complete at the November meeting and a public hearing has been scheduled for this evening. The application will be reviewed for, the com for compliance with section 16-2-4, major subdivision review, section 19-7-2, open space zoning, and section 19-8-3, resource protection permit regulations. Start off, Mr. Fistacci, if you'll bring us up to date at this time. Good evening, my name is Joe Fistacci. I live in Eight Rosewood Drive in Cape Elizabeth. I'm the owner and the applicant of Blueberry Ridge. Blueberry Ridge, as the chair stated, is a 19 lot subdivision located in the northerly portion of town. Off Mitchell Road and between Woodland and Cottage Road. You have a number of documents in front of you, and I'll try to be brief because it appears as though there's a number of people that are going to want to speak on this matter. Um, we're proposing to access this subdivision through Blueberry Road approximately 800 feet long with a cul-de-sac, Fernwood Drive, 300 feet, and then a short street, Red Oak Drive. There will be, or we're proposing a sidewalk on the northerly side of Blueberry Road, on one side of Fernwood Drive, and no sidewalks on Red Oak Drive. It will be serviced by public water, public sewer. We will have um, subsurface drainage in the road areas, catch basins on either side. As a result of our site walk December 1st, uh, it was strongly suggested to eliminate subsurface drainage on the back of the subdivision on the lots that uh, abut the Gowdy Street uh, properties and have surface drainage. We don't have a problem with that. 
fact, we're currently working to uh, design a new drainage system. Ross Cutlets is here tonight with me, uh, a drainage expert, and he can uh, answer questions on that matter. I have hired Tom Emery with Land Use Consultants to design a um, vegetation plan, landscape plan, that will uh, enhance the uh, buffer area between the two properties. And we expect that all the trees in the 20-foot right away will be uh, saved or will not be disturbed. We have a couple of pedestrian easements that uh, I want to <coughs> indicate. We have one coming from Stone Drive, accessing the property. The current pedestrian easement coming from Edgewood Road will still be in place, although it will be altered. You'll have the access coming down Red Oak Drive, down Fernwood, and access to the open space will be through Blueberry Road. This is a path that we are proposing, and this area here, there was one thing that was brought out in Maureen's uh, comments on the subdivision, and um, I want to update you as to what we're doing. Under Q of the Recreation Open Space, open space zoning standards require 40% of the gross area of the development be set aside as open space. We calculated the entire parcel, including the pond area, and we backed off as part of the open space, or actually we, we took credit for this, the pond area. There was a discrepancy or a dispute as to whether I could take, take that credit. So what I'm doing is deeding this area to the town right now so that uh, and they have an easement on it now. It wasn't a, a deeded. Uh, they don't have. They don't have ownership of it. And this is what we're planning to do now. And in doing so, the percentage of the open space would be 48 percent. And we can correct. We can check that and uh, and verify it for the next meeting. But uh, hopefully, by the next meeting, the town will have accepted the the open space area and uh, we are within the percentages. Other than that, I think everything is self-explanatory. Uh, as I said, I, I did want to be brief so that um, most of the people here would have an opportunity to speak. Uh, the letters that I, that I received um, last week uh, seemed to be concerned about drainage, and they seemed to be concerned about vegetation. Uh, to emphasize, Tom Emery is working on a plan to uh, enhance the ve vegetation, and Ross Cutlass is here to explain the drainage system. The land area on the Garden Street property is higher in most cases than the area, or the back area, the, the easement area uh, on these lots, which will allow us to have a nice swale and control the water and bring it towards the front of the properties. Um, there are some pockets of low, low areas, but in, all, uh, in most cases, uh, this is fairly flat land and uh, will uh, enable us to drain most of the water forward to the catch basins. So if there's no questions of me, um, I, do you want to hear from Ross on, or do you want to open it up for public hearing? I think we'll open it for a public hearing at this time. Thank you. I will open the uh, meeting at this time to a public hearing. If there's anybody in the audience that would like to speak to this subject, uh, please come to the podium. I will set a few ground rules so that uh, things can go smoothly here. Uh, number one, we'd like you to state your name and address. Uh, we'd like it to limit to three minutes. There appears to be some people that want to speak and 
Um, also, I would ask you that you not duplicate the same thing that other people state by other than just stating that you agree with so and so. If you have any questions that you ask us, that if we can answer them in a couple of words, we will. If not, we will hold them to the end and let Mr. Fastacci uh, comment on the question. So, if there's anybody here that would like to speak, you're welcome to address the podium. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. My name is Robert Crawford. I'm an attorney in uh, Portland. I, my address is 441 Range Road in the uh, town of Cumberland. I'm here on behalf of the uh, David and Elizabeth Sawyer, uh, Miss Yolan Fogg, Lee Bumstead, <coughs> and Mr. and Mrs. Tom Peterson. Um, what I thought, because I understand your, your concerns about moving us along, is that I might just introduce a few people and have them talk and then perhaps come back and round up a few things, and then we certainly would want to be available for any questioning that might come up. Um, with me tonight, Tom Peterson will be uh, uh, talking to you a little bit about the background and some of the things that he sees in, in terms of the proposal, um, followed by uh, Lee Bumstead. Lee Bumstead will talk about some of the drainage and uh, vegetation concerns that she's investigated. Uh, Ms. Bumstead's comments will be, follow will be followed by some comments by David Sawyer, and then uh, his wife, Elizabeth Sawyer, will also have some comments in regards to the dedication of the open space and the ratio. Um, a, w a couple points I would like to just uh, bring to the point is I think the major concern of the South Portland neighbors is also a concern that should be shared by you for the citizens who may come to be uh, occupying these homes. Primarily the issue is the distance between the existing homes in South Portland, buffers and uh, maintenance of vegetation and some of those attributes that are unique to this area. I know you folks have been out there and, and walked the property. I've had a chance to view it myself. Um, I think one of the major concerns is that this drainage area in here, if that is all of a sudden altered for purposes of the drainage area, that most of the vegetation that's there, those mature trees and other things will be gone. And I would point to your ordinance and your own subdivision criteria. Um, I don't have that's vegetative buffers, section 16.3-1. Um, in your ordinance, subsection C requires the maintenance of it. It's not even a discretionary thing. It, it says, shall be maintained. Um, with that, I'll turn the mic over to uh, Mr. Peterson for his remarks. And, and again, as I said, if you folks have questions about any of his remarks, is there anything that we can provide and assist the board with, um, we, we welcome the opportunity. I thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Thomas Peterson, and I live at 54 Gowdy Street in South Portland. My property abuts the proposed Blue River Ridge development. I'm coming to you with two major requests. The first is that you listen to our concerns as abutters, as though we were Cape Elizabeth residents. For every South Portland abutter that your action benefits, one future resident of this Cape development will also benefit. Back in June of 1994, your town manager, Michael McGovern, assured South Portland residents that Cape Elizabeth would be boundary blind. It doesn't matter which community you come from, he said. Your comments before the planning board will receive equal weight. Mike McGovern expressed these assurances in a letter to the then uh, South Portland City Manager, Jerry Bryant, and also to the American Journal. Uh, at that time, uh, we were talking about the predecessor to this development, namely Rosewood II. And I ask that you honor those assurances. Gowdy Street is an all-American neighborhood, quote-unquote. It's well-maintained. Um, it is um, uh, a street that's uh, tree-lined with esplanades with uh, sidewalks of, of concrete. Um, and these homes were built in the uh, latter part of the 1930s and early 1940s. The streets are relatively wide, but unfortunately the lots themselves are, are not very deep. Uh, they average about 88, 89, uh, feet long. And 
it would be very difficult to, uh, and, and uh, just uh, difficult for, ex for us to accept an encroachment of the development uh, such as this one into our backyards because our lots are really uh, not, very, uh, not very deep. My home, for example, has a rear wing which is uh, about 28 feet long, uh, 20 feet wide. This uh, uh, consists of, a, uh, of an enclosed porch and a workshop, uh, both of which are on the cement slab. This addition was uh, uh, added back in, uh, in 1956. It's only six feet from the property line. Cutting the 50 foot required setback to 20 feet, as we have in this plan, would result in the elimination, I think, of proper buffering and would impinge on the comfort and privacy of both my family and also of that of the future uh, Cape Elizabeth neighbor. My second request, then, is that Cape Elizabeth uh, strictly follow Ordinance Article 7, Section 1972, which requires a 50-foot setback from the building envelope of any adjoining lot. The purpose of your zoning ordinances, as stated in Section 19-1-2, is to promote the health, safety, and general welfare of the residents and to encourage the most appropriate use of the land. The concept of this open space for development might be praiseworthy. But please abide by the 50-foot rear setback requirement and assure the abutters and future residents of the proposed development of proper buffering. In Mr. addition, Peterson, I ask... You're running close to... You're over three minutes, so... Right. I it. ask that you uh, require the performance guarantees uh, for prompt repairs and replacement to any damages uh, as a result of the construction and blasting. And Finally, may I say that I do welcome this uh, new neighborhood, but please, let's follow those ordinances strictly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Peters. Good evening. My name is Lee Bumstead. I reside at 58 Gowdy Street, Bumstead. It's spelled B-U-M-S-T-E-D. Um, Thank you for the opportunity to speak to you tonight. Um, I've spent a lot of time reviewing uh, the subdivision plans, um, your zoning ordinances, and I believe there are several issues that do require your close scrutiny. Uh, how these issues are resolved is of great importance to me because I've abutted this property and these forests for the last 15 years. Um, the concerns I'd like to address this evening are the requirement for a 50-foot rear setback from the existing homes building envelopes, the preservation of mature trees and vegetative buffer, stormwater management, and my concern that the wetlands may not have been properly counted. Uh, first of all, the requirement for 50-foot rear setback. In your open space zoning, section 19-7-2-6C6, it states that the bounds of the building envelope shall be at least 75 feet from the right-of-way of any road existing prior to June 4th, 1997, at least 20 feet from the right-of-way of a road serving a lot at least 50 feet from any building envelope on an adjacent lot. Okay. Since the homes along Gowdy Street and Charlotte Street that abut the property do have building envelopes, it is apparent that the 20-foot rear setback shown on the application is insufficient um, by your own ordinance. Um, I would ask that you enforce your ordinance and require that 50-foot setback. Additionally, from a practical perspective, at least as we learned on the site walk, the developer and the town planner both expressed doubts that you could, in fact, manage storm water and have a vegetative buffer and maintain the trees that are out there. Now, I'm heartened here that there may be some changes that are being made as a result, perhaps, of what we did observe on the site walk. But I would urge you to continue to, to give close scrutiny to this and look at the fact that with the 50-foot setback, as stated in your ordinances, that solves some of these buffering issues and some of the privacy issues. Um, there are some wonderful, wonderful trees, as those of you on the site walk saw, behind our homes that we really strongly ask that you preserve. I included in my letter, and I would like to show you again, I have a tree that's 30 inches in diameter, an oak tree, 10 feet behind my house. I think of this as my tree, the shade of my home, 
It keeps me from having to install an air conditioner. It provides great beauty. It's probably at least 100 years old. I ask you to protect these trees, and I ask you to protect the, the maple trees that are in the 70 to 80 year old range behind our homes. This is not the place to put a drainage ditch. This is a place to preserve trees. The plan that we had heard about a couple of weeks ago and the plan that Ms. O'Meara described to me indicated that these were all going to be clear cut. Now maybe that's changing, I hope it is, but I would like to have the knowledge that that's, that's true, that these aren't going to be clear cut. Um, the general standards of subdivision design in 16-3-1-C state plants or other types of vegetative cover shall be preserved or placed throughout and around the perimeter of any proposed subdivision to provide for an adequate buffer, reduction of noise and lights, separation between subdivision abutting properties, enhancements of its appearance. And as Tom was saying before, I mean, it's not just protection for us, it's protection for these new lots. Let's make these lots desirable lots, not poor lots that um, have no trees. Um, Mature trees bring many benefits. You uh, received an email that I hope you had a chance to read from Jan Ames, who is a uh, specialist with the Maine Community Forestry Program, speaking to the benefits of trees. Um, they do a much better job of managing stormwater than, it, than any ditch is going to because they transpire incredible amounts of water, they hold the soil in place, and so forth. A uh, mature tree can actually remove a ton of water a day. And that's pretty amazing. We should hang on to those trees. They also provide the privacy that we need. Uh, what I'd actually like to suggest is a 20-foot no-cut zone. I think that's something that we should look at strongly. Um, it should also be noted at section 19-9-5-D7 regarding stormwater management states that vegetated, this is a quote, vegetated buffer strips along waterways and drainage swales, unquote, such as the swales being planted for this development may be required. Additionally, section 16-3-1-0 states that Quote, the applicant, wherever practical, shall be required to preserve natural features such as watercourses or bodies, existing trees, 10 inches or more in diameter at base height. Many of the oaks and maples behind our houses far exceed this 10 inches in diameter. I measured the ones behind my house. The big trees average 20 inches. Ms. Twice Bunce, what your minimum is. Ms. Bunce, you are close to four minutes. I'll talk faster. I'm sorry, I didn't know when I prepared my comments that I would be limited I'm sorry, to sorry, but... There are a lot of people that want to speak tonight. Okay, if you I'll talk faster. Conclude, I'd appreciate it. Okay. Um, at the site walk, we discussed um, the possibility of having the developer provide you with a lot-by-lot -lot design showing which trees will be retained. I would urge you to do so. It will preserve our, proper, our privacy and the prop, privacy of the new folks. I just wanted to let you know, too, that what we're looking at as far as distance, our houses are set back about on average on Gowdy Street, 27 feet from the rear property line. So if you were to do a 20-foot setback, which is what the plan is calling for, it's 47 feet. And before the meeting, I measured it. And from where Mr. Griffin is sitting, 47 feet is to the exit sign. So that's, you're looking in each other's bedroom windows. That's pretty close. Um, that's why we need buffers. That's why we need to look at, let's enforce that 50-foot setback instead. Um, to the issue of stormwater management, uh, it sounds like there's some plans in place that we couldn't see it on the plan exactly how it's going to be managed. Perhaps it's still in the works. Um, but what I was told was we were going to have a big ditch drawn behind the back of my property. Um, and I was really surprised when I went to the planning office a few weeks back and Ms. Amira told me that we could have, she said, you can have drainage or you can have trees, but you can't have both. Now I'm hoping that in fact we're working to a point where we can have both because I think that's what the ordinance calls for. Um, my final point is about the wetlands. Um, my am concerned because the wetland delineation was done 10 years ago. DEP practice is that wetland, um, wetland assessments be done within the last five years. And so the concern is, is, is the 4,066 square feet that is being requested to be filled, is that an accurate measurement? Since it utilizes such old data, is it based on a delineation that's 10 years old? Have all pertinent boundaries been rechecked? Was the square footage based on a simple sketch map or on a surveyed wetland delineation? I would ask that it be surveyed again. Okay. Uh, in conclusion, I'd like to ask that you take great care in reviewing the subdivision application. Uh, please ensure that it meets both the letter and spirit of your zoning ordinances and that the rights of the new neighbors, the old neighbors, and the natural environment be protected. Um, 
please make it a priority that you meet the statement of purpose in your ordinance, which says that it's the ordinance is designed to encourage and ensure sound planning and a development that fits harmoniously into the existing natural environment and rural character. Make this your priority, not not making it the priority to enable the developer to get the last possible dollar out of this development. Planning should be not about picking like the lesser of two evils when it comes to things like stormwater management, retaining mature hardwood trees, providing buffers, making a functional design that works well for the new folks, the people who already live there, and the natural environment. Make sure that you're not making compromises that will automatically result in a poorly designed development that won't serve new homeowners, the butters, or the natural environment well. Make this a development that you as a planning board will be proud of, not embarrassed by. Good planning leaves a legacy, and so does bad planning. Once 100-year-old trees are gone, once houses are sited too close together, there's no repairing that. We've got over 14 acres to work with. Surely there's a much more appropriate design that can be developed from what we saw a few weeks ago. Please help make this a good functional design that benefits us all now and in the future. Thank you. My name is David Sawyer. I live at 10 Charlotte Street. I'd like to reference my letter of uh, December 10th, which I submitted to the board. I won't read it for you, but I'd like to just make a few comments, if I may. Um, I'm a, a member of the uh, South Portland Planning Board, and some of these issues are interesting to me, both as an abutter and also as a planner. Uh, we, we, all, we all have heard about the various problems in the area with sprawl, with the high cost of real estate, and I really applaud the uh, Cape Elizabeth Ordinance for trying to address this. Uh, solutions are, the general solutions, and specifically in Cape Elizabeth, are to promote infill development, clustered housing, affordable housing, and that's what the ordinance addresses, and I appreciate that. <clears throat> but I took a phrase out of the uh, National Association of Planners magazine, which said that uh, we should promote reasonable residential scale character and green space. We should encourage forms of infill that enhance community viability. The two key words there are reasonable and viability. And I really feel that this particular development is not reasonable, and I, I feel that it damages the viability of the neighborhood. Uh, how does it do that? First of all, it completely ignores the uh, 50 foot setback to the nearest building envelope that's actually in the ordinance that is written to help cover this. And in fact, there's no uh, variance uh, asked for to, to do this. Another problem is that it opens up Edgewood Road to potential traffic. And in, on the South Portland Planning Board, we had a, a study done to try to avoid what we call cut through roads. And we, I feel that this could potentially be a cut through road from from Cottage Road to Mitchell Road. And the uh, traffic study that was done only addressed uh, Mitchell Road, so it's kind of an open question whether there is there going to be traffic through Edgewood. And if it is, are we going to are we going to study that impact? And is it going to be a cut through road? So I ask you to consider that. Uh, another issue that I went over pretty pretty much in detail in my letter was the fact that there's little or no accommodation made for the natural terrain of the lot. You might remember when we went out on the site walk that the pretty much a big rock with outcroppings, very shallow soil, very, very poorly suited for development without some real special considerations being done. I don't think it's really the proper development to, 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 to use 8,000 or 9,000 square foot lots in a lot such as this or the perfectly level it would be different. So I would ask that you defer back to the underlying 20,000 square foot zone for this particular development. And one more thing, in, in an area, in a place like this that's, that's got a lot of wetlands on it, and I know there was a wetland study done some years ago, but I, it's my understanding that uh, the state will uh, do a peer review at no cost at the town's request. And I would request that the uh, planning board ask the state of Maine to come and do a peer review just to make sure that what we think are the wetlands really are and that we're handling them correctly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Schley. Uh 
Uh, Elizabeth Sawyer, 10 Charlotte Street. Um, I, I just want to make sure David's point about the traffic study. He talked about the South Portland Planning Board doing a traffic study, and then he got on to the traffic study done for the subdivision. I wanted to make sure you understood that the it was it was a little unclear the way he said it. Um, the traffic study was done for the subdivision, was done only um, with Mitchell Road access, not with any um, consideration of Red Oak Drive continuing, because if you remember, the preliminary plan did not show that continuance of this pavement up to Edgewood. And I'm a little unclear um, about the 48% open space, um, and I, I just would, I don't know what the appropriate way to do, ask for this is, but it's just a little bit better explanation about the dedication of open space percentages. I'm a little unclear how that works, because my understanding is in that Rosewood won when it was first approved that all of this pond area was dedicated to the town of Cape Elizabeth already by way of an easement, maybe not by fee simple interest in the property, but it was already dedicated as part of that overall Rosewood plan. So if it's being counted again, um, that's what I'm trying to understand, and I don't think that would be appropriate if he's already said, well, I'm going to dedicate that and then to include it into percentages again. Maybe, maybe I misheard that. Also, keep in mind that this pedestrian easement that can right now exists as a meets and bounds description, which is quite unusual, um, that discusses where it goes on the face of the earth from the end of Edgewood Road, and it's already been dedicated to the town of Cape Elizabeth, and just so that you know, um, that is going to have to be moved, and, the, and I guess the town fathers will have to uh, address that and decide whether or not they're going to give it back, because that, that's already been dedicated to the town this pedestrian easement, which will no, now will cut through, you know, somebody's lot right here, lot five, so just so that you're aware of that. I, I just briefly wanted to let you know that um, South Portland has struggled very long and hard to try to come up with a solution, and that may not seem that way to you folks, but if you could have been at some of the meetings of the planning board and the town council, the city council of South Portland, how they agonized over this whole thing, it's, it's been a terrible thing for my neighbors um, and, and the city council to go through, this discontinuance of these two streets was only done on the condition that, that the neighbors were willing to work with this developer um, to come up with something that was feasible. And the door is still open. And that is why when they discontinued the streets, the city required the abutting property owners who would normally get to the center line of the discontinued street, that they deed it back to the city of South Portland so that it could be recontinued as a public road. And the city of South Portland also dedicated funds, and I uh, may be wrong, it was $1,500 or $3,000 to pay for mediation if the developer was willing to uh, sit down with the neighborhood and say, what is it, you know, what is it that you like? That has never happened. So I just want you to know that um, there is a lot of um, sentiment on both sides of this line, this, this boundary line between our two municipalities that feels terrible about all that has transpired, but we want you to know that we do welcome development here. We just want it to be done in a reasonable fashion. We do have serious concerns about um, Red Oak Drive, Drive connecting to Edgewood Road. I can't even imagine that anyway, because it's going to be Edgewood from here to here. And I'm sure you wouldn't allow the street to be named Edgewood to here and then Red Oak. I mean, emergency um, uh, services E911 wouldn't uh, appreciate that too much, I'm sure. Um, um, I, I guess I've covered the points. Please, please, we, we really want to work with the town to come up with something that's reasonable. And one more quick point. This 87-foot this depth on uh, Gowdy Street is a very serious thing. And, and as you probably know or heard before, I am the South Portland tax assessor and recently have been doing a review of the entire city uh, for purposes of a revaluation. And I've been looking a lot of house lots. 87 feet deep lots is unusual, extremely unusual in South Portland even. Even with all of our little bitty lots, the, even the little bitty 50 by 100 foot lots, they're at least 100 feet deep. 87 feet is a very shallow depth. And I, and I would please remi re remember when we were out on that site walk, whatever planning board members were there, and I uh, pointed out, and Mr. Sherman was speaking with Joe Fristashi, and I knew everyone hadn't heard it. And Mr. Danini's fireplace that's been there since 1941 is on Joe Fristashi's property. And when you saw where that fireplace was and realized how close that is to the poor guy's back deck, 
Uh, it, it's just it, it's just amazing when you see it on the face of the earth. So one more thing, thank you very much for finally the opportunity to speak to you, and thank you for for, for those of you who came out to see. And thank God, you know the trees are off, uh, the leaves are off the trees because you can really see how close it is. Thanks. A lot. I have just a few minor points that came up um, in, the, in the matters that have been presented to you. Uh, one thing that was overlooked is in addition to the 50-foot buffer between building envelopes, I don't think there was a request for any uh, reduction or variance in that in the proposal that sets before you. I would call your attention to Lot 7 on the proposed plan. There is a building envelope adjacent to that that's been identified. And in fact, the building envelope on lot 7 on the proposed plan is not within that 50-foot boundary. The other uh, important uh, distance is the 75-foot from any road that's in existence as of June 4, 1997, I believe, is the critical date in your ordinance. And again, this is under section 19-7-2. Um, this particular lot here, which is lot 12, as, as proposed here, is certainly the building envelope on that is certainly closer than 75 feet from the terminus of Charlotte Street there. Finally, there has been some suggestion that there's going to be additional changes, perhaps in the proposed drainage arrangements, and we would ask the deference of the, of the board to have an opportunity to comment on those changes once they become known. Uh, I thank you for your attention and, uh, and ability to appear before you. And as I mentioned before, if you have any questions on any of the submissions or the discussion here tonight, we'd be uh, most willing to try to assist. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Crock. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is John Schuess, and I live on 83 Gowdy Street um, with my wife and two sons who are here tonight. Um, we've lived on the Gowdy Street for seven years, and uh, we were attracted to the neighborhood because it's a quiet, established neighborhood on a dead-end street and where children can play safely and explore the neighborhood in the woods, particularly nearby, which my sons love. Um, although the houses in the neighborhood are on small lots, the proximity of the, the woods and the space behind the houses, particularly with those towering oaks, provides a feeling of open, openness. Uh, when I heard of this proposal, this development proposal to build 19 houses in the area, I was truly shocked um, not because the site was being proposed to be developed, I think that's fine, but because of the sheer number of houses that's, that are being proposed in such an area. And I certainly don't deny the landowner the right to develop his property, but the issue of density development and setbacks to neighboring property, properties, I don't believe is adequately addressed in this proposal. To build the number of houses <coughs> on a unit this size will require tremendous alteration of the land including removal of most trees and blasting of ledge and rock. And without a doubt, these considerable land changes will have an effect on the adjacent Gowdy Street neighborhood. I strongly believe that the development as proposed will adversely affect the character of our, character of our neighborhood. I urge the planning board to use the setbacks that respect the existing neighborhood and pay particular attention to drainage issues. I'm also concerned about the potential increase in traffic on Gowdy Street if Edgewood Road is used in, as an access road to the development. The traffic on Cottage Road has increased over the years, and access from side streets onto Cottage is challenging and, and at times very dangerous. The proposal calls for traffic to come out of Edgewood and potentially, I would guess, out of Gowdy Street, and this will make the traffic situation worse at the intersections but as important, I think, will increase traffic up and down what are now dead-end streets. I'm concerned about the loss of open space uh, for all of us, especially for our kids. And it doesn't appear as though the proposed open space is accessible or a benefit to existing homeowners. I thank you for this opportunity to raise these concerns with you, um, and thank you for the, your consideration of these matters. Thank you. Sorry. There, there has been uh, um, 
testimony and information before you regarding the building envelopes located in South Portland. And I wasn't sure if this panel had seen the plan, which is of record, which defines those building envelopes. It was submitted to the town in proceedings before the Board of Appeals uh, some weeks ago, and I didn't know if it was considered as part of the town's records that you folks would have access to, or if it would be helpful, we could provide you with another copy of that plan. If, um, if, it, if it was a meeting in Cape Elizabeth, a uh, uh, scheduled meeting, then we would have a record of it. Okay. I just wanted to make sure that that was of record and that you, you folks could have access to it. Yep. Mr. Barron, do you, you have access to it? Okay. Thank Thanks. You. That's my only concern. I didn't want that to be Thank you. something you didn't have. My name is Sue Ellen Roberts. I live at 25 Edgewood Road in South Portland. I've lived there since 1977. By my calculation, that would be about 24 years. It has been a dead-end street ever since I have lived on it. I have cherished the sanctity of my neighborhood and the opportunity to raise my family in such a quiet, all-American neighborhood. I am very worried about the possibility that Red Oak Drive could be connected to Edgewood Road. I feel that would completely change the nature of my neighborhood and my little piece of heaven. I intend to stay there. We're not movers. And I really feel that um, this would be an appalling change to a street that is not adequate to accommodate increased traffic. The possibility of 40 more cars coming down my street, perhaps. We have no sidewalks, our street is narrow, and as it is, um, we're, we're handling just about all that we can handle. Thank you for your consideration of, of my concern. Thank you. I'm Patricia Carr. I live um, at the end of Stone Drive, 37 Stone Drive, Cape Elizabeth. Um, I'd like to um, support something that Elizabeth Sawyer said, that um, David and I have attended the South Portland meetings. We might have been one of the few people from Cape Elizabeth who um, attended the South Portland meetings concerning this development. Um, and I would just like to underscore that my hearing of what was said there was a basic UN principle. When you have distress among parties, sit down face to face to solve the problem. And that free mediation was offered, that they have been asking for this for many, many years. 20 years is what I heard. Whenever these developments come up that have been proposed on this property, they, my hearing of what was said there was we have not been heard. And we offer free mediation, please. And that because they felt for such a long history that they had not been heard, they took the rather dramatic action of closing the road with the offer of free mediation just so they could be heard. I just want to underscore that. I am, we do live at the northern edge of Cape Elizabeth and we do have friends across the line and friends in Cape Elizabeth and it's quite distressing to hear the distress in that piece of the neighborhood. So just on that basic thing of what councils are for is to a place where people can be heard. I think it's wonderful that they can be heard now, but that you have, just to report having gone to those meetings, that you have a group of people who feel that they, and in my perception, have not been heard and have offered free mediation. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Good evening. Uh, my name is Julianne Eberl, and I live uh, with my husband, Carl Eberl, at 54 Edgewood Road. Uh, we've just moved into the neighborhood in the last couple of months and uh, did indeed email a letter expressing our concerns to the board. Um, and I presume that will be a part of the formal minutes of tonight's uh, meeting. Thank you. And I just want to say that we uh, uh, agree with all of the concerns that have been expressed here tonight. Uh, we're very concerned. We moved to the end of Edgewood Road um, with the understanding it was a dead-end street, as are many of the streets along Cottage Road uh, in that area. Um, my husband has Parkinson's disease, um, and uh, the safety of this street is a, was a major factor in our deciding to move there um, and will continue to be as uh, these issues are, <laughs> are discussed. Um, and one other point that I don't know uh, if it's been raised is the issue of radon. Uh, we, our house is also on ledge, um, not quite as much ledge as uh, I believe is out there on the uh, proposed development site. Uh, our home did need to be treated for, uh, for uh, radon um, uh, remediation, which was done. It was a quite expensive process, um, and it will be ongoing for the whole time that uh, anyone lives in the house. So I don't know if that concern has been addressed um, by the uh, developer or the board. Um, but uh, it, it uh, should be looked into. Um, I, and uh, I one final point, um, in terms of history, uh, I was the first baby born in the Levitt development um, of 17,000 homes on Long Island, and that did indeed unleash a Pandora's box that uh, many of us are contending with to this day here in uh, matters of sprawl. Uh, it was my understanding the developer, the developer had initially contemplated a smaller number of houses uh, we welcome that uh, property to be developed, and we welcome uh, new neighbors and look forward to meeting them and interacting with them. Um, uh, however, uh, we just would really ask that the board give uh, careful consideration that uh, the development be appropriate to the history and the nature of the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is uh, Ed Samorian, and I live at 136 Mitchell Road in South Portland, and uh, approximately right here. Um, you showing a sidewalk along here. I don't believe it's on, it's on this one. I have a driveway that came, comes in off Mitchell Road, and it's built down in. It was built in 1952. <laughs> And at the lowest point, it's five feet. And my concern is any children that are living in this neighborhood coming down the sidewalk, taking a shortcut across my lawn would fall down into the driveway and get seriously hurt. <coughs> so um, what I, uh, my solution would be to put some kind of landscaping bushes lighting, and I don't know if there's any lighting here proposed or any kind of landscaping along the side here to protect children that are going towards Mitchell Road on the sidewalk <coughs> from cutting across my property and falling into my driveway. That's my concern. And I drafted a letter today. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Is there anybody else that would like to speak this evening? Hearing no one else, I will bring the hearing to a close. And at this time, the board will begin a discussion regarding this issue. Mr. Fustache. <clears throat> if I may respond to a couple of the uh, issues that were brought up. I want to point out that on July 21st of this year, Richard Sweet Associates did a uh, wetland study on the, on the land. It's in the, uh, 
submission packet, his, his, uh, his findings. Secondly, the pedestrian easement that was referred to by Mrs. Sawyer. Uh, if you go back to the minutes uh, on the original Rosewood subdivision uh, approval, one of the items, uh, and I believe it was Janet Lardner that uh, requested the opportunity to relocate the pedestrian easement within reason. Uh, this land was designated for uh, development in the future. And with that in mind, she uh, had the foresight to put that in the plan. Secondly, uh, excuse me, thirdly, under the open space zoning, um, it clearly states that the board at its discretion can alter or modify the building envelopes to as small as, or to as uh, a five foot minimum. Um, and this is what we're asking you to do, is to review the plan under the open space zoning and to consider the types of homes that people in Cape Elizabeth uh, are accustomed to and, and require and make these alterations and modifications to the subdivision plan. So other than that, uh, we are working on the, on the landscape buffering. We are working on the drainage. Uh, I think that, uh, uh, I don't think I was misquoted, but I did say that if we did use subsurface drainage, then we'd probably remove most of the trees. So I was pleased to see that uh, most people are receptive to having surface drainage on, on the subdivision. <clears throat> Here we open this up to a discussion. Anybody have any questions? Ms. Lowell. And several. Mr. Fristazi, um, as the plan is currently drawn and as our memo indicates tonight, um, it's my understanding that Red Oak Drive, it still appears as though it, it's a dead end and it's not necessarily going to connect to Edgewood Road. It's just to allow the Cape Elizabeth residents access to Red Oak Drive as a alternative during way the work, out of their houses? Or? That's correct. During the workshop sessions, it was discussed, and we were encouraged to provide uh, alternate means of egress for these people to access a public road, um, which we did. We, we expanded. Um, well, actually, it was going to be a, a right-of-way uh, just a gravel open space, but now it's paved, will be paved, and it will have um, all the rights that anyone with a, you know, the rest of the subdivision will have. Does it physically connect, as proposed now, to Edgewood Road? This is being discussed with the town engineer. Um, I guess it's what the board wants. We'll do what you want. But according to... Um, City Council, South Portland City Council, um, they have vacated the last 25 feet of the property process. It went back to the abutters, and it's my understanding that they have then deeded it back to South Portland, and that deed is someplace, I don't believe it's recorded. It may or may not be. The deed is recorded, so now the city of South Portland owns it. So I don't know, you know, what limitations there are to people accessing it from, from Edgewood or, or going through. And I, it's my understanding that these people cannot access Edgewood Road. Still not sure I'm any clearer on it. I was not <laughs> clear myself, so I, I'm sorry I cannot answer it to you. Um, we will provide access to Bolus and Daniel to access Fernwood, Blueberry, and Mitchell Road. As far as the connection between the existing street, Edgewood Road, you know, I don't know how that's going to be addressed, quite honestly. And I think that other people are going to have to make that determination. But it will be paved. It will be connected to it. Thank you. 
Uh, Sorry, I think the excuse me the overwhelming preference of the people on Edgewood, Edgewood Road and the other surrounding streets is that it not be connected by pavement. I, I'm just wondering if any thought has been given to the, the safety issue. I know in, in my neighborhood we have uh, a physical connection to an emergency road, but there's a chain across it so that it's not meant to be a thoroughfare, uh, but it can be opened up in case of an, um, an emergency, which might actually benefit residents in both neighborhoods. Um, I don't know. Have, has there been any discussion between you and uh, the local fire departments or on, along those lines? No. I feel as though I'm out out of the loop on this, uh, that I have nothing to say about it. Um, when South Portland vacated the last 25 feet on both Edgewood and, and Charlotte, uh, excuse me, on Edgewood, they did give rights to Gagnon and Bolas. They did not give them to me, but they gave them to the two people living in these two properties. So I don't know whether you can deprive those two people of, of accessing it through South Portland. It's a complicated matter, and uh, could, I think could, uh, Maureen, could, could we have uh, Maureen O'Meara speak to this issue for a minute? I'd love to have. Um, Chris Boulis, who's one of the people, first of all, Edgewood Road in Cape Elizabeth only exists as a private right of way. It's, it's not a public road, and it only existed after the first phase of this development was approved in 1992 when we discovered that the Gagney lot had no frontage on anything. It just had, they had to pave the, the land that extends off of Edgewood Road in South Portland and we found that it was a paved area that looked like a street but it was nothing in a legal sense of a street. So when the Bula lot was created, the, the, the private right of way that is the extension of Edgewood Road from the Cape South Portland boundary to the Bula lot was created. And that's how both the Gagneys and, and the Bulises accessed their home. Uh, not that long ago, the 25 feet from the Cape South Portland boundary extending into South Portland was vacated by the city of South Portland. There's no legal road in that section anymore. There is physically a road there. There is legally no road there. The Gagneys and the Bulises have a, an easement from the city of South Portland to cross that area to access the rest of Edgewood Road. And that's the only way they have to get in and out of their properties. Um, Mr. Bullis called me today, wanted to be here tonight, is on call, and I'm assuming that's why he's not here, but he has expressed in prior meetings and in writing that he would like to have access to his house from this new subdivision. If we do that, there is no physical way of creating a, an access without making this physically a through point. Legally, it's not a through point. And if the town of Cape Elizabeth puts a chain up at the South Portland Cape Elizabeth line, we will be blocking the easement that the Gagneys and the Bullises have to the city of South Portland. Any questions? <laughs> So in other words, if we give them access to the subdivision, then there will be a physical roadway through there, even though they're the only ones that have the right to use it from their house going towards um, South Portland. That's the best I can tell, yes. Maureen. Maureen. Uh, if the Olises have indicated a desire to use Red Oak Drive, have the Gagneys indicated any similar desire? I have not spoken directly with the Gagneys. Mr. Bullis has told me that he has spoken to them and they are, want to be part of the subdivision, but I have not gotten any of that information directly. As I would offer to fellow board members that but for the easement of those two houses over into South Portland, with the exception of that one item, uh, any concerns about traffic going from Edgewood Road into this subdivision and needing to be counted on Mitchell Road are totally groundless. <clears throat> any, any other question? Any other responses to the... No, I... Okay. 
I hope you understand. I at it's, least understand it better. Thank you. Yes, it's complicated. It's complex. It's not a. It's not an easy issue. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, yes, I, I have a question for the applicant. Um, at this point in time, uh, I, I think it, that the, uh, the 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 landscaping and and buffering uh, plan or survey or whatever what what is in the works now uh, will be a valuable thing to be part of the application. And I was just wondering, from from the description and the lay of the land. Uh, topographically that you were uh, speaking to, uh, the Gowdy Street being slightly higher than Blueberry Road, but not really a steep slope, uh, and you were, you were speaking about the water sh coming across to Blueberry Road uh, as opposed to vice versa, the water from Blueberry Road heading toward toward those, those areas. Uh, the initial plan package showed a couple of catch basins near the property lines there. Uh, is there going to be any type of, uh, could you describe the, the purpose of those at this point and is there going to be any type of uh, drainage swale cut parallel to the property line which is sort of, that would be sort of cross slope uh, from the description so far of the lay. And, and I know that's all in, in preparation now but is there any sort of uh, description of that that you could offer at this time? Is it an overboard, overland type of drainage or, or, or is it yes. all underground and, and as a result of uh, east-west sort of swales being cut or anything like that? Um, first, Ross will answer that uh, the best he can and I'll answer it the best I can also. Uh, we're still working on that plan, but one thing is certain those catch basins that were identified on your on your plan are now eliminated. Oh, okay, they're okay. Going. Okay. So we will not be doing subsurface drainage. Um, we expect that because the Downey Street property is a little higher, and we're not going to be filling in that 20-foot easement, we may be doing some buffering. But as far as wholesale filling and, and wiping out of trees, that's not going to occur. Um, we have done some, some uh, plotting of trees in the last uh, couple of weeks since the site walk. There are some diseased trees and basically some dead trees there. Uh, they will be removed. Um, but we will swell it the best we can to control the water and bring it forward. Once we can't bring it forward, uh, we expect that there will be some type of drainage system, subsurface, culverts covered over to collect the water put it in the, in the proper place, in the drainage system, collect it, and come down and bring it up to Mitchell Road. Uh, Ross, if you want to respond to that. Ross Cuthbert, civil engineer, working with Sue Stassi. Um, just to just add a little bit to what he is referring to. Um, as you know from the sidewalk, knowing the property, that there's uh, quite a bit of cleared area. Um, over the property line down down through here already, which lends itself nicely to landscaping, berming, and plantings in that region where the bases have been eliminated. Um, <clears throat> the, the intention is, is, as Joe said, is to allow the flows to continue to move overland in this direction, um, gathering the natural pockets. We'll lo lo we're working on locating topography that allows us to move through between the homes to field inlets, which would be right at the edge of the, <coughs> the, edge of the curve drop down into the system at that point. So there may be some some sort of inlet, small inlet uh, grate or protected orifice at a couple spots along the road to allow the water once it moves across. So it won't be impeded coming through. Um, just to elaborate a little more. Thank you. Thank you. One of the advantages of, of um, using surface drainage is we can preserve as many trees as possible. That also allows us to preserve trees between the property lines. And as you heard uh, from the people from, uh, that spoke earlier, there are a lot of nice tall trees there. Some will be lost and some will be preserved. And we'll try to preserve as many as we can. Mr. Chairman, along those lines, are, are, 
Are we going to get a more specific uh, depiction of what trees will remain and what trees will will not? It, it's just it, it's hard for me to evaluate the plan when you, you say things like we'll do as much as we possibly can. Is there, are we going to get something more specific uh, on on a plan? Yeah, we plotted we plotted uh, all the trees in the 20 foot um, drainage easement uh, and identified them. Uh, Tom Emery with Land Use Consultants is working with that plan to uh, add additional trees. Um, hopefully, again, I, I doubt that any trees will be removed except for the diseased trees. So you will have the plan identifying which trees will remain and what we're going to be doing to enhance the vegetation. Uh, and I expect it will be on the probably the rear five-foot portion of the drainage easement. Um, and we will swale the rest of the area or, or the area before the, the 20 foot uh, uh, drainage easement. But yes, you will definitely have a plan. And um, probably this is a good time to say this. Um, I expect that it's going to take longer than the nine day turnaround period between tonight and when submissions are due for the next meeting. So we probably would like to request that, that we be put off until the February meeting to give uh, professionals the opportunity to respond to the concerns that we've heard tonight and your concerns that I expect we're able to hear. But you will definitely have a plan. I have uh, <clears throat> one question. Uh, uh, you are working with the town engineer regarding the road design. Uh, do you have anything to update us at this point on that? Um, Steve Hanning had several uh, concerns, and uh, Dick Manthorn, who designed the subdivision, is, is working to uh, respond to his, his uh, issues. Um, I think the fire hydrant was one item. The uh, Cape Cod uh, detail on the, on the curbing is another issue. Um, We'll be discussing again Red Oak Drive, but I, I really would like to have more input from the board on, on how we address Red Oak Drive uh, and what is needed there so we can put it in the plan for the, for the next meeting. Um, but I can we, give we, you, we have responded to most of uh, Steve Hanning's concerns. I could give you a couple of my thoughts relative to that, but I do believe you need the turnaround at the end. Um, you need to uh, believe... Uh, touch base with the fire chief to make sure that he's satisfied that if a piece of equipment has to go down there, he can turn around and get back out. On, on what's that now? The Red Oak. Well, you do have, you, you do have the turnaround easement that was designed yep. by uh, two Cape standards back in 92. So, I mean, it's, he, he designed it basically and he uh, approved it um, back in 92 on the original Rosewood One subdivision. Just as long as he, you know, concurs with it now, okay. it'd be wise to check with him. That, that's my issue there. Um, are you at the point yet where you've decided on the curbing uh, or anything like that, or is that not? A bituminous Cape Cod curb, okay. <clears throat> which I think is what the town has uh, specified. Okay, thank you. I have a couple of questions, Mr. Fristacci. I guess the first, again, going back to the Red Oak Drive issue, and I appreciate your confusion in terms of how that's going to end up. Um, my concern, though, and maybe Ms. O'Meara can address this, it's one thing to say that there's no legal street connecting the two. However, if physically they're connected and it's paved, Clearly, there's the potential for traffic to access from one to the other. Um, if that's a potential, I, for one, would like to see a study of what that traffic may look like and, and how it may affect uh, both ends of the, the street and, and the new subdivision. I mean, I think we would be remiss in just saying Legally, that 25-foot portion can't be 
pass, so therefore we will assume there will be no traffic. Uh, or if there's some provision where that is blocked off except for emergency access. And Maureen, that's where I was confused. The abutters that I believe you said have a right of way to Edgewood Road in wanting to become part of the subdivision, so to speak, are they willing to give up that right of way to Edgewood Road or do they want access from both sides? I've never asked that question and we've only heard from one of the abutters directly. Because um, that to me would obviously be an important question. Obviously we couldn't force them to give, give up their right of way, but if they want to be part of this subdivision and have the access, <coughs> perhaps that might be something they would consider. Otherwise, I guess what I'm saying is if that, if that access way is open, then I think we need to see how it would be affected from traffic. We can't just assume that a car is going to stop right at the end of Edgewood Road because they've been down to the town and realized that it's not a legal 25 feet. That isn't going to happen. <laughs> um, my other question, Mr. Fristacci, I guess is just a more basic one. And, and uh, I think you interpreted the regulation correctly and that we have the discretion regarding the setbacks of the property line. But I'd just like to hear from you as to why we should exercise that discretion for 20 feet as opposed to some other setback and why that's necessary um, for this development, other than the fact that it would allow this, this many lots. Maybe you can address that for me. The open space zoning Lot sizes range from 7,500 to 9,000 square feet, substantially smaller than what Cape, Cape Elizabeth is used to. The need for the setbacks very clearly is to design and build the type of house that the Cape Elizabeth buyers are asking for. The Type homes are in the vicinity of 1,500 to 2,000 square feet, two-car garage, and they'd like a deck. Without a setback uh, reduction, it would be very, very difficult to build the size and type of house that people are requesting. Um, the uh, cost to develop the land the roads, the sidewalks, the drainage, the buffering, brings the overall cost of this uh, subdivision to a price range where the cost of the lots can only um, be justified by a, a home in the 2,000 square foot range, 2,000 or, or greater. <clears throat> so that is why we need uh, reduced setbacks. What I'm asking for is what you did to the uh, Abaco Road subdivision and what he's doing there on 10,000 square foot lots. Uh, there were setback uh, variances, or I won't say variances, setback reductions given to Whaleback, uh, uh, Whaleback Ridge, uh, another subdivision in, in Cape Elizabeth, to accommodate the type of home that, that the Cape Elizabeth buyers want. Um, I need them. I requested them. The zoning board graciously um, gave me the variance to go to 15 feet. And I didn't ask to have it reduced down to 5 feet. I feel as though with 15 foot you can still have 30 feet between the properties and still build a reasonably sized home that uh, would accommodate the Cape Elizabeth needs and also be sensitive to uh, side and rear setbacks. Um, currently I'm building a house, uh, a 32 100 square foot house in Falmouth. Side setbacks uh, are five, side and rear setbacks are five feet. This is in the Cornerstone subdivision. All the homes in that subdivision are 3,000 square feet and greater, and they're on a 10,000 square foot lot. That's the maximum. 
and there's still plenty of space between the properties. And it's a nice subdivision. Most of the houses are three hundred and fifty thousand to four hundred thousand dollar homes. So that is why I'm asking for it, because of, of the cost of the subdivision, the price the eventual price of the lots, the size of the homes that, that Cape Elizabeth people buy us uh, would, would like. And what we'll tell you I believe I submitted in my packet examples of homes, kind of uh, it's creative use of the land. Um, originally when I went to the zoning board I asked for a uh, a five foot rear setback reduction, but then I dropped it. Um, I feel as though because the lots are wider, <coughs> I can reduce the rear setback, uh, the, the depth of the house, and maximize the space between these homes and the Gowdy Street properties. Well, I guess just to give my two cents on, on that issue, I it's not in the regulation, and it's not any type of legal standard, but I view a little differently someone coming into a, a development where the setbacks are, are delineated, and they know that if they buy this house, the setbacks are 5 feet or 10 feet, whatever, as opposed to a development going in next to an existing neighborhood where those people are the, already there. and. I think that's a little bit of a different, a little bit of a different story. I, I guess what, what I would say, regardless of what discretion we exercise on, on the 20 feet, is that it, it will be critical that there be sufficient buffering and, and screening so that uh, the, uh, the impact on abutters, whether they be South Portland or Cape Elizabeth abutters, is, is minimized given the small, uh, the small space on, on the setback. I have a couple of other items that, that I'd like to, I'd like to ask Maureen if I don't know what the setbacks in South Portland are, but do you, do you, are you aware of a lot this size and what the setbacks are? I, I believe, and, and uh, South Portland Planning Office can call me tomorrow if I get this wrong, but I believe in the district that immediately abuts this one that the setbacks for principal buildings is 20 feet and for accessory structures is 6 feet. Thank you. I am... Uh, this issue of of complete completing Red Oak Drive is a, still concerns me a little bit, as it does probably everybody on. But I think we need to somehow um, get to a point where we we all are on the same page. Um, we hear from the people that spoke tonight that, uh, that they don't see an interest in connecting the two roads for traffic reasons. We heard on the sidewalk that there were some people concerned about the safety of emergency vehicles getting in and out if one end is blocked and they can't get in. So, And we heard about the chain, but I'm kind of wondering how we can get this off dead center at this point so that we could look forward if, to the next meeting that, that we have, that we know where we're going. Uh, if you had any suggestions uh, or if you had any suggestions as to what other people in town we should bring in to, to get it to, our, to where we should be. We haven't really talked to the present landowners that, other than Mr. Bolas, and we'd need some confirmation from them before we recommend to, I think, to Mr. Fastacci as to what the proper way to go here. So I'm not exactly sure how we could cover that issue, but I think we need to at least get it out on the table. If anybody had any suggestions, Mr. Shu. Mr. Chairman, uh, it seems nothing is going to happen as far as preventing food traffic on Edgewood Road onto this development's road unless the city of South Portland approached the two individual property owners that they gave an easement to from Edgewood Road and see if they would be in agreement to giving up their easement if they were gaining access to a public right of way. 
on the other end of this development. Until that happens, the possibility of through traffic traveling on a roadway that may or may not be public is going to be a common occurrence. Because until the city of South Portland determines a way to rid themselves of the easements they gave these two property owners, there's never going to be a chain there. And the possibility, the definite possibility of illegal through traffic is going to exist on a daily basis. So those easements ha somehow have to be done away with or there is going to be through traffic on that street. And there's nothing this board or the city of South Portland can do about it unless those easements are taken away from those people with their full agreement. How would you uh, suggest we do that? We have no jurisdiction to do anything. It's up to the city of South Portland. And that's a chair. Uh, just to uh, revisit uh, an earlier comment that came up today, if one, if one is thinking in terms of uh, the great American neighborhood, one of the hallmarks uh, of the great American neighborhood is a concept called blocks. There are streets and cross streets. People can walk in different directions. Uh, through road connections benefit everybody in their convenience of getting around in the feeling of developing a neighborhood I think it's an absolute shame that that is not being pursued by anyone interested in this proposal uh, and the, the more connections and the more you have things that look like blocks that people can go out and walk around on an evening and, and, and enjoy uh, I think that that benefits uh, everybody in the neighborhood, and I'm not talking about this application, I'm talking about an area of land that has certain characteristics and certain densities exhibited in the existing neighborhood uh, that are not that different from what's being proposed in this neighborhood, uh, but the existing, the existing people who live in this area have uh, apparently done everything in their powers to prevent the great American neighborhood from growing. Uh, and I find that rude and out of place in these proceedings, and it's obviously indicative of the, the attitudes and the approaches to people in, in looking at what could be something beneficial to uh, everyone. Thank you. Mr. Sherman. Yeah, I think uh, reasonable minds can differ on the benefit of a through road there. Uh, my inclination would be to try to prevent that from happening or encourage this applic applicant not to allow that. I understand that it's not really under his control. I think one step would, would be to simply, if it's possible, to simply speak with these two uh, property owners, the Bulises and the, the, the okay. Cagneys, and see what their position is. And as uh, Peter suggested, uh, they may be very eager to give up their rights to the easement that the city of South Portland granted them. And then if they are, then, uh, I don't know, Maureen, is it possible for them there to be a follow-up with the city of South Portland on that issue? You mean, do you want me to call the city? Yes. I can call the city yes. of South Portland, yes. Okay. Well, I guess I'll get back to my to my earlier point on that issue, though. It, it, it's, not, it's not giving Mr. Fustacci a lot of guidance, uh, but if we assume, as we must, that this road can be accessed, don't we still need to see what effect that access will or will not have? I mean, that, before we get to the issue of we should convince these people to give up their right of way or not give it up or close the road or whatever, um, I don't really have enough information to know what sort of traffic would go through there and how often and how quickly and everything else. Um, and maybe it's a chicken or the egg type thing, but I guess we have to assume that the road as it stands today can be connected and traversed and therefore, like any other application, we probably want to see what traffic would look like. Morning. at the risk of backing up Mr. Wilcox. Um, the board may want to note that 
these roads in this subdivision were designed under the same standards as the Cross Hill subdivision, which in fact is a large development with a through road. And we haven't heard of any issues with uh, too much traffic going through there, with unsafe conditions, except for people who would like the road to be wider, which of course would then require people to drive faster. Um, if you did require the applicant to do an analysis, you may in fact discover just that fact, that um, an actual through block connection would not create the kind of safety issues that, that people have concerns about. Maybe. I, I don't know that. Uh, basically what we are, unless I'm mistaken, what we're going from possibly is what was a dead end road to what will be a through road. And I think that deserves uh, some type of study just to see what, what the effect will be it, from both directions. Traffic from this neighborhood going towards Cottage Road and traffic from the other side going towards Mitchell Road. I just don't know. That's all I'm saying. And it would be nice to know. I guess to weigh in on this, my preference would be to consult with the Cape Elizabeth residents at the end of Edgewood Road um, to determine what their desires are, and I don't know who the appropriate person to do is um, to do that is, um, if for no other reason than to save the expense of possibly, I don't know what a traffic study co costs, um, I would say that to counter your point, Maureen, um, Edgewood Road does empty out onto a much busier road, and it is difficult at times to get out onto Cottage Road. Um, and I can see the benefits um, as a parent of young children of having a dead end road with a lot of, not a lot of traffic. Um, I don't think a chain across a road um, needs to inhibit um, neighborhood circulation and friendliness. Um, so my recommendation or my preference would be to consult those property owners and see which way they lead us. Any other questions? Uh, 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 this relates to Red Oak Drive, but not the issue we've been dealing with. I know that that particular drive does not have a sidewalk on it. Um, yet, uh, my understanding of the easement to get to the open space would go across that. And I, I'm just wondering what thought was given to perhaps putting a sidewalk in there to enhance that uh, easement for the, the folks on the Edgewood Road area that would be coming through the neighborhood uh, to get to the open space. I think one of the reasons we deleted the sidewalk is just to uh, downplay Red Oak Drive as a, as a, as a road. Um, initially, as I mentioned, we wanted to have it gravel. The town engineer suggested paving it. Um, we were trying to provide every opportunity for it not to appear like a road so that the people wouldn't use it as they threw away. And that's one of the reasons there's no sidewalks there. We haven't got the request yet to put a sidewalk in. I'm sorry? We don't have the request yet to put a sidewalk there. We had the request to, to pave it. We're hoping we don't have a request to put a sidewalk there. And if there were a sidewalk there, would that impact would that have an impact on the lots as you've outlined them on your plan? I don't think it would have a negative impact. I don't think it would have a positive impact. There's an opportunity to put a sidewalk there, most definitely. Uh, and, and I guess on the sidewalk issue, why are you asking for a waiver of, of the requirement that there be sidewalks on both sides of these roads? Um, well, it's a small, compact neighborhood. We wanted to show as much grass as possible on the front yard. Um, we feel as though one sidewalk is adequate for, for a small subdivision so that people can walk, push their strollers or whatever. But again, to give the visual impact of a, of a deeper front yard. I just have one more question on this 48 percent 
figure. Uh, I have a question for the, the uh, town planner. Is, is the certain uh, land being counted twice, as has been suggested? Uh, in the memo that I gave you, I reviewed the open space calculations. And as you're aware, uh, the ordinance requires that 40% of the gross area of a development site be set aside as open space. Of that 40%, at least one third has to be dry land. But it's the 40% that really catches your eye. Um, I was concerned, and I will continue to take the position that land that has already been set aside as permanently protected open space cannot count towards that new 40%. Um, Mr. Fustashi took an unusual uh, step in 1992 when he donated the pond area. He donated a conservation easement but retained fee ownership of the land. Um, that's very unusual. Most developers in Cape Elizabeth, when they create conservation land as open space, they donate the entire parcel. They put a conservation easement on it and they donate the fee ownership of the land to the town of Cape Elizabeth and it transfers title. Uh, Mr. Fustashi didn't do that. Uh, I, we've met on this. I believe the approach he wants to take now is that he's decided that, yes, in fact, he, he should have donated the land itself as well and will be taking steps, I believe, very quickly to donate the land um, that is already subject to a conservation easement to the town. Uh, once he does that, his gross area of land falls. When he does that, calculating all the remaining land that is now out there as, as potentially developable land. He's telling us, I have not checked these numbers, but if you subtract out the pond area and then you add up all the other open space, uh, that it then results in 48% of the total reduced gross area. So I think the next time Mr. Fristashi submits his plans, we'd, we'd be checking that again. Okay. Well, let me just, let me, can I just follow up? So Maureen, what you're saying then is that if he donates the land as is now proposed, that issue of counting the already set aside land twice goes away. Right, because he wouldn't own the land anymore. The, I mean, the, the best thing would have been if he had given us the land and the easement in 1992. And I think he, in his generosity, has decided that he, he's going to do that now. So that would that would solve the. It, question of whether I, I like I said I want to I want to reserve that until I see the actual numbers but right now if you subtract out the pond area the, the area that's currently subject to the easement his total open space donation is 36 percent so he's, he's close to the 40 percent right now by removing the pond easement totally out of the gross area as well as the open space my guess is he's going to go above 40% pretty quickly. Does that make sense? Because you're, you're changing the, the gross number to begin with. Okay. When Dick Manthorn did the calculations, he took the total area, 647,459 square feet. And he, he read the, the open space ordinance and it said the gross area of the development. And he included this as part of the gross area. And that's how he came up with 62%. This plus all the green area, 62. And he came up with that number by dividing Three hundred seventy-eight thousand by the six hundred forty-seven thousand square feet. But after discussion with Maureen, to make it very simple, we're backing this out, which was one hundred sixty-two thousand four hundred and fifty-eight square feet. We're backing that off the total uh, total area, which was six hundred forty-seven thousand four hundred fifty-nine. That gives us four hundred eighty-five. 1,041 square feet, and we're dividing that into the, um, the 168,112, 
That's the area of the of the lots, and that's a result of a 48 48 percent. And we'll check it, and we'll have this available for the next for the next meeting. And hopefully by that time, uh, a deed uh, was prepared this week, and we hope to be on the January um, council yeah. council meeting. One other, one other item that I'd like to. Um, you mentioned earlier that you are redesigning that swale and on the edge of Blueberry regarding the uh, detention area. Are you? Do you have some revised ideas or changes that you? Well, I'm working with one of the abutters to um, to redesign it. And again, hopefully at the next meeting we'll have the redesign plan and all the necessary uh, items in place to present to you. I would just like to suggest that maybe you consult with some of the new methods of designing those detention areas to make them a little more pleasing in appearance um, and, and hope that maybe you can do that and, and reduce the visibility of it, make it more pleasing. I think it would help you. The whole development. Yeah. Mr. Chairman, I have some questions, Mr. Frustazzi, about the wetlands um, on lots one and two. Um, it's been suggested by the town planner that, um, and been recommended to you, I guess, that you get a resource protection permit. Um, it's anticipated that due to the small size of the lot, lots that um, once these properties are built upon, the future owners will want to do landscaping that will potentially encroach within those wetlands. Um, have you considered obtaining this resource protection permit for those lots? Yes, I think it's uh, been applied for already. Yes. Thank you. We're, uh, we're disturbing wetlands over here and potentially over here. And I think it's in excess of 4,300 square feet, so we, we have applied for it. Does that cover lots one and two as well, Maureen? It, that would be the total area that will be disturbing. Total, yeah. 4,300 square feet. Right, right now he's showing four separate well, wetland alteration areas. Mm -hmm. Two of them have to do with the detention basin and the, the connections to it, and the other two are lots one and two. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. If the board members don't have any other questions, I have a motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Joe Fustacci for major subdivision review and a resource protection permit for the 19 lot Blueberry Ridge subdivision located off Mitchell Road be tabled to the regular January 15, 2002 slash February 15, 2002 meeting of the planning board. Make one? Okay. We'll make that the February 15th meeting of 2002, Mr. Stasi. Second. The uh, motion's been made and seconded. Are there any comments? Uh, before we take a vote, I just would like, as the chair, uh, to thank the citizens of Cape Elizabeth and South Portland for sharing their thoughts with us tonight. Um, I hope you will realize that they will not go unheeded. Um, the situation will go on, and, and uh, we'll do everything we can to try to incorporate some of your thoughts. Thank you again. No, any other comments? Uh, then I will raise the uh, motion to a vote. All those in favor? Show by raising me. No opposed. It carries.
right there. The Myers, the Dyers, the Denis. We're right across the street from the Dyers. We're over here. There is. Yeah, the road will be here, and there's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven houses right along this behind all behind the Pearsons, the Dumstads, Millers, and the Tires. Is the city of South Portland when they discontinued the road? What's this? They landlocked them. That's the pond that you guys are playing. Which one? What's that? Which one? The skating pond? That's the pond that you play in. The uh, final item on our agenda this evening is the uh, town council has requested uh, that the planning board consider an amendment to section 19-7-8 of the zoning ordinance that would allow off-site parking for uses in the BB district and up to one mile away. The proposed amendment is scheduled for public hearing this evening. The amendment will be reviewed in accordance with section 19-10-3 amendments. At this point, I'd like uh, Ms. Romero to describe the changes. Uh, Right now, the board has a section in the zoning ordinance that regulates parking requirements on site. It also provides an opportunity for a limited amount of parking to be provided off site in certain areas. Right now, the only the only uses that that can take advantage of the off site parking opportunity is in the town center in the business A district. This amendment would extend that also to the BB district. Um, The other thing it does is right now off-site parking must be no further than 600 feet away from the use for which the parking is required. This amendment would change that to within one mile. Uh, The board did express concern that while there was the uh, desire to provide for off-site parking as an opportunity in BB District and up to a mile away that the parking, where parking lots are going to be created, that they needed to be created in such a way to be consistent with the neighborhood. So there is a specific uh, one additional paragraph that has been added that states that where parking is proposed elsewhere than on the lot occupied by the use for which the parking is required, Planning Board shall approve or deny the off-site parking after considering the impact on the neighborhood. The Planning Board may require that the off-site parking be designed or improved to be compatible with the character of the neighborhood with specific consideration given to traffic, landscaping, buffering, and lighting. At this time, I would like to open this to a public hearing. If there is anyone in the audience I don't see anybody in the audience. <laughs> anybody comes out of the woodwork? <laughs> Has any comments? I see none coming, so we will quickly quickly close the hearing. And uh, if there are any comments to be made at this time by any board members or any questions, uh... Mr. Chairman, I'm ready to make a motion. We've discussed this thoroughly in workshop. I'm waiting. Motion for the board to consider be it ordered that based on the materials provided and the facts presented, the planning board recommends the amendment to section 19-7-8 of the zoning ordinance allowing off-site parking in the BB district up to one mile away. A motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Motion's been made and second. Any further discussion? Then I will, uh, hearing no discussion, I will present it to vote. All those in favor of the motion, please. Motion carries unanimously. At this point, is there any further business? Uh, Somebody would like to make a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion. We adjourn. Motion's made. Second. 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 All those in favor, I uh, declare this meeting closed on the 18th of December.